Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We just concluded, as you know, our NATO defense ministerial, where General, or T Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, just said that rem NATO remains committed to projecting stability beyond its borders. And in a world of wash and change, NATO stands firm as an island of stability in a turbulent sea. Projecting stability requires NATO's political stance to be backed by a credible military force that is fit to fight, reducing the chance for miscalculation. To be fit for our time, NATO deterrence and defense posture must continue to adapt. During the ministerial, we discussed strategic nu nuclear deterrence issues to include America's recently re released 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, on which many of our allies were consulted, and it was very well received. The review is very well received across NATO. The U.S. approach to nuclear deterrence embraces two co-equal principles. First, ensuring a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. And second, working wherever possible for nuclear non-proliferation and arms control whenever it advances stability and security for us and our allies. Nuclear deterrence and efforts to foreclose proliferation and reduce the number of nuclear weapons are not mutually exclusive. Separately, I believe we made excellent progress on uh, numerous issues uh, during these last two days. We discussed the imperative for shared investments in defense spending and key capabilities to improve what we called the culture of readiness. We have broad and deep support for Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg's initiatives to modernize the alliance and provide ready forces responsive to NATO's political direction. This includes increasing the speed of political decision-making in a crisis, adapting the NATO command structure, and accelerating military mobility, working with the European Union, and ensuring that ready forces can move swiftly should the decision be taken. In 2014, three nations, as you just heard from Secretary General Stoltenberg, three nations in 2014 spent 2% of GDP on, de on defense. That was the same year that NATO nations met in Wales and pledged to aim for achieving 2% by all nations by 2024. This year, eight nations will meet the 2% target and 15 nations have plans to be there by 2024 and France by 2025. Year on year across the alliance, 2017 saw the largest growth in a quarter century, the largest growth in the percent of GDP committed and the largest real growth in a quarter century. And since 2014, for example, over $46 billion have been added through the defense budgets uh, applied to NATO. And I think that much has been committed. I think much has been accomplished. And as Secretary General Stoltenberg just said, much remains to be done. The American people have demonstrated our commitment to the NATO alliance. We do so based on the belief that fellow democracies will honor the pledge we made to each other at Wales. As Secretary General Stoltenberg said yesterday, the U.S. continued commitment presents an incentive for Europeans to do more. Enhanced NATO-EU level of cooperation is also growing at a steady pace, and the path ahead for such collaboration is taking firm shape with the two groups working together. We discussed NATO's key role in the continuing fight against terrorism, NATO being a member of the Global Defeat ISIS Coalition. Although 98% of the territory once held by ISIS in Iraq and Syria has been liberated, the fight is not over. And we recognize and agreed to remain committed to the immediate and longer term missions. At the government of Iraq's request, NATO will sustain its investment in Iraq to project stability into the geopolitical heart of the Middle East. And America supports NATO's initiative for a NATO training mission in Iraq. In Afghanistan, we are committed to filling critical shortfalls in our staffs there to enable the campaign to drive the Taliban to reconciliation. 
It is the collective dedication of the 29 nations and working together creates collective strength as we fight the threats from the east and from the south and defend our values. And then we are committing more funds to this to, to defense. We are collaborating more closely, whether it be on nuclear deterrence or conventional defense. And we are implementing a culture of readiness while holding the line against terrorism. And combined, this makes us strong. As you can see, the U.S. remains fully committed to NATO, our union of democratic nations united in our efforts to protect our populations and our way of life. And here in Brussels, we are given a practical example that connects deterrence, defense, and projecting stability. So I, I think it has been an excellent two days here. A lot of work has gone into it by military and political staffs, and we are making progress. So uh, it's never done, of course. Uh, what we're doing is an ongoing effort, but it's all going on the right trajectory. So may I take some questions? Let's start with uh, Lita Baldor from the Associated Press. Hi. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary. You've talked a bit uh, before you came and while you've been here about requests you've made to a number of the allies on several subjects. Can you uh, give us an update on what progress you think you made on uh, seeking more support from allies on taking detainees from Syria and also on filling those gaps in the Afghanistan war. Um, yeah. Can you tell us specifically yes, where you are on, on that? Uh, filling the Thank gaps you. in Afghanistan, we are still engaged with various nations. Uh, right now, I believe we have 12 nations that have committed specifics. Others are still going through uh, the requirements. So I see it going in the right direction. But again, more work needs to be done. Uh, as far as the taking of prisoners, here's the situation. We, I came to Europe, and I needed to lay out the problem. Uh, the problem is that we now have hundreds of prisoners who have proven not quite so, uh, so uh, have not quite the same amount of zeal they once pronounced when they were winning that they would fight to the death. Well, it seems like hundreds of them are no longer quite uh, that committed, and we now have them in temporary facilities, and so I wanted to bring this problem to everyone's attention. And there are no uh, illusions about that we would solve everything in 24 hours. Uh, what I think we have done, though, we have laid out the issue in a way and addressed that somehow we must, we, the collective we, and individually we, must take responsibility to address this issue. That has been accomplished. We will go with uh, Al Arabiya, Nordin Fridi. Mr. Al Arabiya, here, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. Sir, Nordin Fridi from the yeah. Arabian News Channel. Could you elaborate a little bit about the scale of the training mission, uh, NATO training mission inside Iraq? And would you uh, please address the um, Mr. Secretary Tillerson uh, statement calling on, upon Iran to withdraw its mm -hmm. militia in Syria? As you uh, saw last days, it becomes okay. one of the strongest. Uh, let me take let me take Iraq strategy. first. Uh, the uh, foreign ministers and their representatives met in Kuwait two days ago, uh, as far as helping Iraq get back on its feet after the trauma it's been through at the hands of ISIS. Uh, I think they got off to a very good start. Frankly, I thought it was a better initial commitment than I anticipated uh, with the first meeting there. Uh, and that's going in the right direction. At the same time, you heard from Secretary General Stoltenberg that in regards to Iraq, where we've generally used mobile training teams, they go in, they train for a while on demining or counter IED or, or whatever the issue is, uh, and then they come out. We believe it's in NATO's best interest that we project stability at the government of Iraq's request. We will go to a consistent mission in Iraq to build the capabilities that they believe they need to sustain this effort and protect their people from an uprising of another type of uh, terrorist organization, something like this. Uh, and you had a question on Syria, was it? It's about the, the Iranian militia in Syria, which becomes a serious regional uh, security problem, mainly between, as we saw, the, as they, the confrontation between Iran and Israel inside Syria. Thank you. 
Yeah, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I, I cannot explain why every time there's a problem in the Middle East, whether it be in Lebanon, South Lebanon, and Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, it's in Syria where Iran has propped up Assad, it's in Yemen uh, where they're uh, using it for a launching platform, the civil war for missiles into Saudi Arabia, whether it's in Bahrain where the Bahrain police have captured explosive material Provided, I cannot explain uh, why Iran insists on many of the things it does. I think it's best that we leave Syria to Syrians and Stefan de Mestira's efforts by the UN to solve this in Geneva is the right way to go. And in Iraq, uh, it's, the same, it's the same sort of thing. Let, let's have Iraqis vote for who they want and, and project their own image of themselves. They don't need outside interference. Uh, yes. Go Next, ahead. Agence France Press, Sylvie Lantelli. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, you met with your Turkish counterpart yesterday. Uh, did you get any assurance that Turkish troops are not going to engage uh, the SDF in uh, uh, Mount Beach? And uh, Turkey used pretty harsh rhetoric to ask uh, US to leave Mount Beach. What was your, your answer? Yeah. I think uh, we are all keenly aware that NATO has only one of its nations, one of our allies that has got an insurgency inside its own borders. And NATO and America stand with Turkey on its legitimate security concerns. And they're right next door, as you know, to Syria with all of the uh, chaos there that presents, presents an ongoing threat. Uh, and you see this isn't just about uh, Turkey in that case. You also see the disruption in Jordan and Lebanon and Iraq. So Turkey has got the same kinds of concerns. In fact, they've provided refugee support for, for millions of refugees out of this, this, uh, this, it can only be called a tragic situation in Syria. So we maintain absolutely open and honest dialogue. Uh, we met yes, uh, two days ago in Rome uh, where uh, my counterpart, my colleague from the Ministry of Defense was there at the uh, Defeat ISIS meeting there in Rome. We talked here yesterday uh, for an extended period. We are coming together on what we can do together. Uh, it's probably the most complex security situation, fighting situation I've seen in, in over four decades of dealing with, with fights. And it is one where I believe we are finding common ground and there are areas of uncommon ground where sometimes war just gives you uh, bad alternatives to choose from. But throughout this, the one thing that has marked our communication is absolute honesty and transparency with one another and a full briefing by uh, the Minister of Defense of Turkey to the assembled 29 nations on the military operation they have going on. And we continue to collaborate on ways to ensure their legitimate concerns are addressed but our goal is to get this into the Geneva process and solve it. It will not be solved uh, by uh, Assad or by the Russians or by anyone else. It's got to be solved under the UN auspices, and uh, it's got to be done that way. And that's what we're all trying to get to. The last question will be from uh, Daniel Brossler of Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, sir, are you concerned uh, about the increased uh, military role of, European, of the European Union? Do you think that might, uh, that might uh, weaken NATO or duplicate efforts uh, NATO is doing? And the second question, if I may, are you disappointed uh, that Germany will be nowhere near 2% in 2024 and that it is not even uh, specifically mentioned in the coalition agreement? I, you know, we have to recognize that every nation has its own political processes. Uh, when I say a union of democracies, it doesn't mean that everyone has the exact same processes, the exact same kind of federal powers, the exact same kind of budgeting processes. I am confident that Germany will continue to move up in terms of its defense spending at a pace uh, we all hope is uh, 
matching uh, the strong economy they have and their very, very strong stance on moral values, moral leadership, and human rights in the world, and those are issues that need to be defended. Uh, in terms of uh, the European Union, ladies and gentlemen, we have very candid discussions. Uh, I believe right now we have sufficient rigor in the political sharing, the political discussions to keep the EU effort, for example, on military mobility being one that enhances uh, NATO's common defense capability and does not draw down on it. I am confident of that. It will take constant work because, of course, any organization will always expand. Uh, it, it's kind of in the nature of international organizations, but there is a clear understanding to include in written EU documents that the common defense is a NATO mission and NATO mission alone. But uh, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thanks very much.